Awesome. Yeah, good huh? Hey. So everybody, I'm I, I'm losing my voice. So if I start sounding weird during the meeting, that's why. <laughs> so if I start having squeaks in my voice or something, that's oh, the Everything tonight is just about editing um, the first stuff and like none of it's like hard and fast rules. Of course, it's all subjective, like most things in film. And some of these things are kind of going to bleed into each other, like when to cut, when not to cut really goes with pacing, timing, rhythm, story and emotion of the scene and the moment. Yeah. So those kind of go together. And then how long to edit is just basically a general rules of thumb of how long it might take or how long you might should schedule for your edit depending on how long your project is. So we're talking about when to cut or when not to cut. Um, you want to not come into a scene too early. And if there's nothing important, if there's no Im important information there about the characters, there's no extra information about the emotion they're feeling or the location itself, like an establishing shot or the plot in general, then the scene's gonna start feeling very bland and may feel too long and boring if you come into it too early. We don't need to watch, we've said this before, I think, but we don't need to watch the person walking up the stairs for the entire length that they're walking each step. We can start watching them walk upstairs and cut to them already up the stairs. There's nothing important there and there's nothing important about the this kind of the timing or the pacing. If there's no mystery about what might be upstairs if there's like nothing there then there's no reason to show it because it's just going to elongate the scene make it kind of boring and make it have some stuff that we don't really need to see so that's where the cutting comes in and it's like it's not exactly like you can't have it for every single project it's never going to be the same it always depends on what's going on in the scene or what the story is and it also <clears throat> and it also goes with what the the pacing is and what you're trying to do. Are you trying to have, maybe maybe you do wanna show him going up the stairs the entire time because he's thinking about what just happened in the previous scene and that was a very emotional moment or maybe it's a horror film and we're expecting something to come out and um, be up on the top of the stairs when he gets up there and jump out of his room or something. There's all these different things for reasons why you might show the entire thing but in general, if there's nothing there and there's no reason for it to be there, then um, it's a, it probably doesn't need to be there in the first place, which is a good reason to just kind of cut it out. Audiences are smarter now than they, they were when cinema was first coming out. Cinema first came out, they had a lot of these very long scenes and they made it very much like a play where they were just kind of watching what happened and just watching the entire scene play out before them real time, a lot of the time. And as cinema kept growing and more people kept watching and understanding these new techniques and seeing them in new movies, started um, all the audiences started grasping, you know, what these things mean and putting pieces of information together. So now when you start out with the person going upstairs and you cut to them already up there, audiences can tell, yeah, he walked upstairs. Like they don't need to have that information there if it's not important and it doesn't do anything for your for your project. That makes sense. Make sure that every like scene has a purpose for telling the story and deep like it's all in the details mm -hmm. yes like so yeah, editing is very much about the details and the the little every things part is. i think every part right. in film is really about the details and the better you get it that in general the better the whole film comes together and then you don't just have a video you have like a beautiful piece of cinema yeah no definitely and like if, if one piece is missing, it definitely hinders the rest. But since editing is that final touch, it's that one moment where you can really make or break that film. If, if the director did do it for too long, if the cinematographer has way too long of a scene and the director agreed that that's what they need to have in it, editing is the last chance they have to see that it's not working and to cut that scene to make it work and flow better for the project overall. So. Mm -hmm. Editing is very important to the to the final aspect of that filmmaking process, but of course the rest of the things all lead up to that. And if they're not done well, then it's a lot harder to make a good yes. project. You can't really make a good project if nothing was filmed correctly and everything looks like crap. Then in the whole thing, and if the story was bland and the story in general for the script wasn't there, then uh, editors can't make magic. They can make it a little bit better, but you know 
all those pieces definitely play into each other. Yeah. Um, going along with like not coming into a scene too early, you also don't want to leave a scene too early if there's some important information in there. When I always like using this example is when there is something that emotionally just happened, sometimes it's good to stay on that person's face or stay with them in that moment a few seconds longer than you normally would for any other take, just to see their expression, to really feel it and to really take in how they're feeling because that will connect you more to that character and what they're going through. You also don't wanna leave a scene too early if there's more questions there, um, unless that's intentional, unless it's intentional that the viewer be asking what's going on and they find out later in the movie perhaps. But uh, if it's only in that scene and there's some information in there that is needed, then that you usually need to stay in that scene a little bit longer just to get all that information out. Um, but you also mm -hmm. don't want to stay in the scene too long when there's no new information present. Yeah. So if there's no new information about how that character's feeling or details about what, what needs to be heard, then you can leave that scene without it impacting very much. It doesn't matter him going back downstairs, for instance. We don't need to watch him go all the way back downstairs. We can watch him start to exit the room and we get the idea that he's leaving and that the scene is over. So, um, those are some things to keep in mind when you're talking about scenes in general. Just make sure you're not going in too early when there's nothing there. There's just boring information that nobody really needs. You're not leaving too early when you're leaving out important information or character motivation or emotion that can really help impact the way the viewer sees what's happening in the film and the next scene. And you also don't want to stay in the scene too long to where you're not leaving on time and there's just unneeded information and boring stuff happening after the fact of whenever you could have left that scene um, earlier. So uh, a few things can drive a cut. They're, um, they're called the, the drivers of a cut could be either dialogue, someone speaking, of course, that can start driving a cut. Someone else starts talking in a scene. We want to see who's talking. And then when they have a back and forth, you can cut back and forth between those two characters. If a third character chimes in, it's a good time to cut to the next person and vice versa. You can just keep going around in the circle, cutting between different people. So dialogue is definitely one of the biggest. If there's narration. If there's any narration in the project, then um, cuts to go along with that narration are always good. And that's a good motivator for there to be a cut. If narration begins, we can now cut to our next part showing what the narration is talking about. Maybe it's a diary journal. We can cut to that diary journal and see the person writing it while the narration overlays what is happening, or maybe it's somebody opening a letter, or maybe it's just general narration talking about the scene in general, um, or like what the person's feeling in that moment. Any of those things is a good driver for a new cut. Music, um, when music is a driving force of the scene, something like a montage, that's a good motivation for a cut, obviously, because then you gotta cut to the next pieces to kind of match it to that music. Um, music sometimes is just in, in the scene itself as, as part of a, a background song or they're at a bar and they're hearing this song or this singer. Um, and so those types of things can really motivate the cut to show what's happening in the, with the music. And especially if it's matched to the music, like they're putting their cup down at the same time that the guy's drumming, um, he, the next beat of the drum, then uh, those things are obviously places where you might want to cut to make sure you're matching it up. We'll talk about that in a second. We're talking about rhythm because that's another spot you would have it where you're matching music to the cuts. And then, um, you know, visuals, of course, is another driver of cut, of where to cut. If there's a new visual that needs to be seen then, or if uh, the cutting on action that can be considered the visual, the person turning their head, we wanna see what they're looking at, where their eyes are looking, things like those. Visual is a, is a driver for a new cut to whatever the, whatever's going on, whatever they're looking at, whatever they're showing us. If they're opening up their coat, we wanna see what's inside, why are they, why is that important? Is he having drugs, weapons, what's in there? Or is it just a letter? 
So those are good ways, uh, good drivers of a cut. Sounds can also be a cut. There's a, there might not even be anything actually on set, but somebody was supposed to drop a glass in the kitchen or somebody just broke into their house. And so a sound effect will be added. Those are good motivators and drivers for a new cut, to cut to a different angle or to cut to something else. Maybe it disturbed the person. And so we can break that 180 degree rule to really shatter our viewing expectations. And so we're more in lines with the character or maybe we're just cutting away to whatever broke. You know, those are always good things um, and good reasons that you could uh, cut away to something else. And, or, you know, a ring at a doorbell or a knock at a, at a door can also be a, a reason to cut to anything. So, I mean, it's, it's, some of this stuff is like very obvious, of course, but it's just like when you're actually editing, you just want to have a reason to cut. You don't just want to be cutting around for no reason, cutting to make it look cool. You should have a reason and a motivation and a feeling for why that cut needs to be there. Um, and it could just be that it's taking too long and that it feels boring. So you need to cut and get to a new, a new uh, take on it, a new angle. You need to view the information from a different part. And that's okay, as long as you know where to make that cut and you just have a, a feeling for it. Editing is very much about feeling what is right. And that's why you can give the same stuff to two different editors or more than two different editors. And all of them are gonna come back with a different project. It's going to be in a different order. The scenes are going to be cut differently. And it's just because everybody has their own way of, of feeling how it's going to be. Just like with a script, you can give that to multiple people. You can give them the entire story and they're still going to write their characters differently. They're going to have little pieces of plot in the middle that are very different. And maybe everybody's attitude during that plot is different. And uh, yeah, so it's the same things with editing. If you give that to different editors, they're going to come back with multiple films because cutting isn't exactly a science. It's more of a feeling and a, there's a flow to it and there should be a reason for it though. Um, whether it's emotional, it should always flow with the story and the emotion of the scene and then try to uh, follow the rest of the rules like the 180 degree rule and the, the uh, spacing, stuff like that. I'm gonna go back to this thing. Uh, Walter Murch says, with emotion, story, and rhythm are the main guiding factors for where to pick a cut. And then it's the eye trace, which is like where the people are going to be looking at in the scene during that moment. The 180 degree rule, make sure that's followed. And then the three dimensional space, making sure that everything's kind of in a good continuity, spatial awareness. So I'm just gonna go back to this. He gives the emotion the biggest percentage though, 51%. So even if you have all the rest of the things, if you don't have the emotion right in that take and that shot and that cut, that moment, it doesn't matter. People might notice that there's a cup in the scene that shouldn't be there or that you broke the 180 degree rule. They might not notice exactly what it is, but they kind of feel a little weird about it. Um, the rhythm is a little different. It's a little jarring. You know, it's not the same as the flow of the whole thing. And it's advancing the story. Maybe it's just kind of a subplot. And it's not advancing the story to a great extent. It should. But even if you don't have any of those, they're going to know how they feel during that moment. They're going to know how they feel towards the characters, how they feel towards the plot, and how they feel towards that scene. And that is the main thing he says that, uh, Walter Murch, that's the main thing he says is the motivator for a cut. Make sure that it has the emotion you're going for above all else. Even if it has everything else, if it doesn't have the emotion right, then it's a bad cut. It's a bad shot. It's a bad moment. So make sure that's there. And he says emotion, story, and rhythm, they pretty much are in tandem. They pretty much go hand in hand. It's going to be rare for you to find something that follows the emotion that doesn't advance the story or there's something that has the right rhythm but doesn't have that emotion correct because the rhythm is very based on timing and things like that. And if you don't have that right, then the emotion you're going for is probably not right. So all those three things are pretty much always going to be there. But the other three things, like where people are gonna be looking, 
during um, that they could be looking in certain areas of this of the shot depending on which which character speaking where the character starts looking where the focus is at in the moment of the scene if the camera has any movement things like that and then the 180 degree rule and you know spatial awareness like continuity and stuff like that they'll notice those things but they definitely aren't as important as just the, the story the emotion and the rhythm of the of the uh, shot All right, so going on from that, I'm just gonna stay on this screen actually, but I'm gonna start talking about rhythm, story flow, timing, pacing, and emotion. I'm gonna start with rhythm. And this actually is from John Tyndall, and it was letter A in the syllabus for, it says rhythm and film editing. Rhythm is the pacing of a film, scene, or even a moment within a scene. Most films, the average shot duration is around four to six seconds long. That's it. One shot lasts for about four to six seconds on average. Once an editor has established an average duration, they can then speed up or slow down the rhythm by shortening or elongating the duration of each shot. Fast paced editing, it's typically associated with tension and, and action. And slow paced editing is typically associated with calm or the release of tension, like after something really, um, like a big fight just happened. Then you start, you want to have some calm moments to give the viewer some time to breathe and to reflect on what just happened. Or maybe you just want the character themselves to reflect on what just happened. So, four to six seconds is average that doesn't mean that has to be every single shot is going to be four to six seconds long it just means when you add them all together and divide them it's about four to six seconds each and that's the general thing i've heard from like pretty much everybody they said that's pretty standard for hollywood films now four to six seconds long and then when you're doing slower paced you can go it goes up to any amount of seconds you want you know, I can go from seven to 100 seconds. It just depends on it, as long as there's good information there and there's enough stuff going on to where the viewer's not gonna get really bored. And then fast pace can go a fraction of a second. It can be really, really quick, just depending on what's happening in that scene. But it's just good to know that you know, when you're setting up a rhythm, you might not even notice it when you're editing, honestly. But when you're setting up a rhythm, most of your shots are going to be around the same length until you get to those moments in the story that need to be either faster paced or slower paced. And then you should start thinking about either speeding up your edits or slowing it down to change what you're trying to show and what we're trying to portray. If we, again, if we are staying on a scene where the character is having an emotional moment and we stay on them for a few seconds longer, we are extending that shot. That length of that shot is extended past the four to six seconds average. And that tells the viewer that there's something important here. Why, well, there's a reason why we're staying on this shot for so long, because now they're used to this established shot length that the, the editor set up earlier in the film or the, the TV show or whatever it is. They're used to that length. And now when we come to these, these shots that are very long, it tells the viewer that something important is happening. Maybe somebody's speaking and they're having a monologue. Well, maybe this dialogue is a very important or they're just looking at a character's face and his expressions. Well, what is he thinking? What is he feeling? Something important is happening here. Why are we staying on the shot for so long? There's something here. And then the other thing is if you're going faster pace, they might not notice it when you're going, maybe at each shot lasts for two seconds now, or it goes from, from six seconds to five seconds to four seconds, and you keep speeding up the shots to build intensity and build action. Your viewer might not even notice it, but subconsciously they'll start to feel like something's a little bit more intense. They have to start keeping track of things a little faster because they're moving 
quicker than they used to. So now they're, it's kind of like a heartbeat. Once they, once they start, once you get into a, um, a moment where you are getting more excited, your heart starts beating faster. And so it used to be slower and be like, boom, 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 boom. And now it's like, boom, 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 boom. And it just keeps speeding up. And that's the same way with like films. A lot of films, if you stop and watch these different scenes, especially where it starts out kind of normal or even slow, and then it speeds up because something's getting ready to happen, you'll start to notice that the shots start to um, quicken. They start to be less and less long. And that just is a subconscious thing for us to view and see and um, start to feel that without actually noticing it, unless you're actually paying attention to it, um, which then you can obviously notice it because you can literally count how long they're taking to change the shot. But if you're actually watching the film for its story, which hopefully that's what you want to do, you are going to not really notice it, but you're going to feel it. And that's the intention of the editor. This next one's come from B. This comes from Jay Lipman. And, oh, he actually just said what I said. Your audience will get subconsciously used to rhythm that is established. So when you slow something down, the audience, whether they're aware of it or not, will know that they should pay more attention or something important is happening. Similar, similarly, they will notice a speed increase as tension is rising or as it's high, just subconsciously. I'm going to go to C. This is the film look. <clears throat> it says some films use similar shots at the start and end of a film, either showing the symmetry, the growth, the opposites or the similarities between the two moments. That's a part of rhythm. You have this whole setup. You start it out with something you have the whole middle, it could be a huge long time. And then once you get to the end, you end it on that same shot, reflecting back to that beginning of how things have changed or how they've grown or how they've stayed the same. Um, there's also something called, known as the rule of three, which states that something needs to happen at least three times before it's seen as a pattern. And so for their short film, if you watch their video, they show an example of it. Um, they use this to show what the characters were doing. If, they, if the character, I think he was cleaning the room, they wanted to show three different times, three little short shots of him cleaning so that it's established that, okay, he's cleaning the whole room. He's not just moving the chair. He's moving the chair. He's moving that. He's setting up the chair over here for the school. Um, and so he's the janitor. And then they show another example where they're doing three different shots of things that are blue and then three different shots of him. Um, I can't remember what the third thing he was doing, but basically the, the, the idea is that if you only do something once or twice, it's going to seem kind of random. If you do it three times, it's starting to become a pattern. And if you do it four times or more, it could start becoming like we get it. Like the audience is gonna start getting like, okay, we understand. We don't need this information. It's redundant at this point, which is why that rule of three, which is just, you know, general rule doesn't mean it's going to, it's not hard and fast rule. It's just, if you do things too many times, the audience is going to feel like you're thinking that they're dumb because they already understand what you're doing. So now you can move on, but you're continuing going just in case they didn't get it. So you want to kind of keep thinking, if you're trying to show something happening, um, it's a good idea to maybe do They're it. treating you like you're dumb. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you said, them. I don't know, maybe I heard it wrong. That they're thinking that you're dumb. Yeah. As a viewer, because you're not getting it. You're not getting that he's a janitor. So we have to show you that he's also taking out the trash and we have to show you yeah. that he's mopping the floor and we have to show, like you don't have to show too much. So just keep that in mind. But that also goes with like when you're shooting. Um, you might want to, I think Brian had always talked about this. Whenever you're shooting, it's all, that's why it's a good idea to know about these things and know about editing in general. Because when you're shooting, if you're shooting for the edit, you can really save a lot of time and you can save a lot of effort on shooting extra stuff that's never going to get used. And the, it goes into these shooting ratios and stuff where you shoot too much, where you don't. We're not going to need it. It's just going to take extra time to edit because now they have to look through a lot, lot of garbage to find the good stuff. 
So if you already know what you're going for, you're able to kind of um, plan this stuff out and put it into your edit like they did. Um, some editors will create rhythm to sound or music within their scenes, sometimes matching the cuts to rhythmic beats. So it's not always about shot duration. Rhythm can also be like an actual song. And when you have a rhythm of song, you might actually play the, the scene back with that song. It just depends on if that was intentional. If it's not intentional, it's kind of hard to get that. You have to be pretty good at editing to get like an entire scene to match a, a movie without it feeling weird. But usually those kinds of things are, are intentional for the story itself. And so you'll have all the footage for it and it'll make that rhythm with the scene match the song, whatever song they're going for. Oh, rhythm also, it's obvious to spot if you're watching something like a montage, you can spot rhythm really quickly because they match the montage scenes and moments to music or to different beats where it's like uh, very easy to tell what they're doing. Usually when you work, when you're doing rhythm, when you're actually put like doing rhythm on purpose, you're, you're not really trying to be, make it obvious. But when you're doing it to music, it's, it's going to be very clear why the shots are set up that way, why the shots are cutting to this and that at these specific beats and times. Um, so just keep that in mind. But usually you don't want it to be so obvious. You, a lot of cuts, you want it to be where the audience isn't going to really tell or notice what's going on. They're just going to feel it. You don't really want to take them out of the movie and have them. You don't want people to know that they're watching a movie when you're making one. You want them to just feel it and to forget they're watching a movie is the best thing because then they're just involved with the thing and they're, they're paying attention and they are connected to it. Moving on from now, we're going to talk about story a little bit. Story didn't have too much to it. A lot of these are just like real quick and simple because like a lot of them were saying it's really hard to explain these things because it's so abstract and so subjective that it's like explaining color to someone that has never seen color. Maybe they've been blind from birth. It's really hard to describe what the different colors are and why they're different to each other. So some of this stuff is like very, um, it's, not ex it's not exact, like you, it's hard to explain. So a lot of them were saying like, they, they tr they're trying to explain it and hopefully it makes sense, but a lot of it's gonna be very much about how you feel when you're editing or how your editor feels when they're, when they're watching it. And that's why it's important for them to understand what the emotion is supposed to be, what is supposed to be happening in that scene. Because if they don't know, they're not gonna be able to edit it the way that it should be edited to come across the right way. <clears throat> With story, this is again from Jay Lipman. He was saying story and plot are different. And this actually comes from um, Walter Murch as well, I think, in his book, the, In the Blink of an Eye. Story and plot are different. Story is the series of events in a chronological order, while plot is the series of events arranged deliberately so as to reveal drama, theme, and emotional significance. In other words, the plot moves the story along while the, I mean, the plot moves the story along, yeah. So the story is like the overarching thing and the plot is all the details that go into it to make you feel connected to that story. Um, and he, he was saying that's when a lot of people start messing up with their edits is because they're editing it based on the plot when they should be editing based on the story. Plot, you can change around the details. You can have one of the past scenes happen after you show the present day. But a story is kind of like a beginning to end. It's going to have a flow. There's going to be, um, if you're telling somebody a story, then you want to, I don't know, I said, how do I say this? 
um, if you're telling somebody a story, you want to keep them interested, but you can't do that if you're just giving them the big picture. Kind of want to give them all the details so they can understand and, and get connected to it. He gives an example in his video, which I thought was pretty good. He kind of goes, it just goes a little more deep in, in depth about how the kid was feeling. He actually bases it on a children's book. Um, and he first tells you the story, which is basically like just the summary of what, what it is. And then you, you get the idea, you know the story now, but when he tells you the plot, you really get to feel why that kid was feeling that way, why it was, um, why he felt bad, because now you had the details, you had the little moments in between, the little emotions he was feeling during each thing and each thing that happened to him to make that story work. So whenever Walter Murch is talking about advancing the story with your edit, you're just making sure that that overarching story, whatever it is, that it is advancing. If the, if the story is about a guy losing his wife, then you could say, yeah, and you know, the guy gets married, he, you know, he falls in love, he gets married, and then she gets sick and she dies. The end. There's a story. So you just want to keep advancing that story, but in those moments, you're able to do whatever you want. You're able to hold on to the shot to show that he is feeling sad or that he really loves yeah. her or she really loves him. And then adding in all of the details and like coves or like twists in that as well. So it's, I think it's great to start with like any story you can start with a single sentence or log line, right? And then it expands out into like all of the main plot point tones and then adding in all the details so that every single shot in the story looks and feels brilliant. Right. And uh, an example, yeah. of, I would I love of, story. example mm -hmm. I would think of is um, if you were going to tell a story about that, the guy falls in love with a girl, they get married, she gets sick and she dies and you're editing it and they shot a scene where they fight. If you're trying to just look at it from the plot perspective or the story perspective, you might say like, well, they shouldn't fight because he's supposed to love her. Um, but then if you're looking at it from like the actual emotion and the, and the, I'm sorry, if you're looking at it from the story, just for the story, then you might cut that scene out because it doesn't flow with the rest of the story. He says he falls in love with her, then she's gonna die. So if they fight, that's not really that good. But if you're looking at it from the plot's perspective, showing that they fight and that, you know, they, they are like normal people and he, it's gonna show that he loves her even more because yeah, everybody fights and he chooses to overcome it and stay with her and work better and become better because of her, things like that. So the, you don't want to edit just based on the story. You also want to edit based on the emotion that is within those story moments in the plot because there's little arcs within the overall arc. But you also want to make sure that it's not detracting from the story. It's not something that has nothing to do with that whole story. You know? So you want to make sure that when you're cutting and when you're editing, if you do have these extra scenes that they do in fact advance the story. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, yeah, everything comes together. And then you have, a, that's when you have the cinematic flow of story. I mean, once you understand like the beats and the flow and where to say things and how to put things together, it becomes not easy per se, but like then you can start really playing with the differences is in the details. Like a lot of like in genres, like a lot of the stories, like the plot places, placements are very similar. It's like writing a piece of music. Like the basic structure is oftentimes similar, but it then comes down to all of the details. Yeah. How it differentiates. Cause you can have like a hundred different stories of a guy who has a wife who's going, who dies. You could have a hundred different stories based off of that log line. Right, but then when you get into the nitty gritty of it, the characters, why does do do the does the audience also see that they love each other? Does the audience feel that and connect with them or not? Yeah. Because they might not. If you've written the characters wrong and you're editing it and you're just kicking out all those little moments of showing that, then they might not feel connected to the story. The story is still there, but the. Uh, the rest of it does not work, which is why Walter Merch puts emotion above all else, because that just, it makes the whole thing tie together. Makes sense. Um, 
moving on to flow, which is why, like, again, this is, it's hard to describe a lot of this stuff for real, because it doesn't, there's no real way to say exactly what it is. So you have to kind of like, once you start working on it, once you start doing stories and things like that, you start to understand exactly what it means, especially if you watch a lot of films and you're just kind of pausing it, taking a moment to think about why they did certain things or how that worked or how that did not And hopefully once we watch a movie for its editing, we'll see like little things that they did in the edit that kind of attribute to whatever the uh, film was about and how it worked and how it made us feel as the audience. But anyway, uh, moving on to flow. Well, sort of flow, timing, those two things kind of go, all these kind of go in with each other. But anyway, flow, time remapping is one way you can adjust the flow of a scene or of a moment. Of course, you can't really slow down shots that don't have a higher frame per second. But speeding up or even speed ramping can really affect the flow of something kind of like a fight. You've seen, probably seen this a lot. Zack Snyder loves to use slow motion and speed ramping in his works. So whenever the characters are fighting, when they're in a big fight, it's not playing in real time. It's not all playing in slow motion. There's often a web and flow of when they're getting ready to punch, they might slow it down and then they might really speed up really quickly and then slow it back down. And then there's like a ebb and flow of it going back and forth between how fast and how slow it's moving. Um, and that adds its own unique perspective on it. And it adds a bit of, um, it adds its own kind of rhythm to it because it's not the same as just watching it in real time. It's not the same as watching everything play out in slow motion. You're kind of watching the main pieces that they want to show you in slow motion for you to pay attention to what's getting ready to happen. And then the fast parts where you don't need to pay as much attention because you understand what's happening. And, and then again, also some movies will match, they'll use time remapping time um, to match movement to music. I think even in like Zack Snyder, I think he does this in his films too, where there's the music playing, they already know what they're going to play. And then the edit, you're editing it with the music. So you are slowing it down and speeding it up during different parts of music. Trailers will do this a lot. If you ever watch a trailer, you'll see that they definitely edit it to the music and they could slow down or speed up the different scenes and different parts to make sure it matches. Whenever someone's shooting a gun, they might match that to a big drum beat or um, I don't know, whatever those other, the big drums are called. <laughs> but whenever they have like very like um, big action or something like that happening, they'll usually map it to the music Yes, Mel? Oh, does it make a noise when I unmute? No, I can just see it. Oh, okay. I was just, were you going to say, uh, just, did you mean bass? That's yeah, all. yeah, I meant bass. Thank <laughs> you. Debating whether or not to even bring it up. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. So, yeah, like you'll see a lot of trailers will do that. They'll, they'll match the different moments. We said it's good to bring it up in case you, we get something wrong or misspeak or like there's a better way of wording it. So don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah. it's just more of the like interrupting of the hey, hey, flow of the conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah but That's you good. can um, always yeah, and you can always text it if if you prefer it that way. But yeah. Um, Exactly. So they either do like bass or they do um, on the drum beat, they will have those action moments happen so that they are more impactful or so that it just matches the music. Um, and that can also happen in films. It just happens a little bit less often because it's very noticeable. So uh, films sometimes will do it if they are actually if they're going for that. But other ones will try to avoid that so that it doesn't become obvious and they don't get taken out of the movie and know that they're watching a movie and things like that. 
also and when we're talking about flow sometimes there's going to be moments in the edit when you have camera movement in the shots and you are going two different shots and when there's a flow of movement maybe the movement's going from right to left in the shot and then the second shot it's going from right to left again that third shot if it all of a sudden is starting to go from left to right it's going to mess up the flow and unless that's intentional it can also mess up continuity in the way that maybe we're watching a character walk from right to left in the first and second shot and the third shot it's from the left to right we're going to automatically think it's someone else and it's not going to match it's going to break that 180 degree rule first of all but when you're having one character that's not really that as important but when there's movement you definitely want to make sure that it all flows together because um otherwise it just it just messes it up and it kind of uh, is jarring so unless that's intentional you kind of want to make sure those things go in order you'll see a lot of um video too video on youtube and things like that that have like travel videos when you're seeing different movements happen they usually aren't changing the movement from shot to shot the ones that have a lot of views and are liked very well anyway because those ones know that there's a flow to it you want to watch things go from left to right and then the next shot should be left to right and then once the once the movement stops that's when you can change it and do whatever you want for the next shot same thing in films so you know there's ways to reverse in the edit you can um, flip the horizontal plane of a shot so if nothing is like easy to pick out and see that he you flipped it maybe there's a word on his cup on his clothes if you flipped it in the shot that word's going to now be backwards so it's going to be obvious what you did but if nothing like that is there you can maybe flip the shot so that it goes from left to right as well or right to left or uh, whichever way the other shots were going so that there's that flow and you can cut from one to the other without it being weird and jarring Moving on to pacing, which goes in with pretty much the same thing as the rest of the stuff. <clears throat> this comes from Film Editing Pro, or me. I just added some things that I was thinking about while he was talking about this stuff. This is from him. Um, too, if you make something, if you make a, a scene or a moment too fast, you're going to lose people. And if you make it too slow, you're going to bore them. So generally, it's better to cut well, generally speaking, it's still better to cut too fast than to cut too slow because boring your audience is going to be the worst thing you can do. But cutting it too fast is also something that's a close second. So if you think about like a, a very fast paced fight scene, yeah, I picked Bourne movies because this one's not that bad. The one that I'm showing, I couldn't find the exact one I was going for, but I know there's one in there or a few. Um, where they're just very fast. There's a lot of camera movement and there's a lot of cuts. And I start to forget what's even, I don't remember who's punching who or what's going on. And this, it's easy to tell because it's the same movement. He's punching him three times and we're just cutting to different angles. But when they're both moving around in a circle, they're both wearing similar looking clothes. They're both dark. It's hard to see. And they're cutting around from one thing to the next. And one person gets thrown over a table. A lot of action movies. Oh not just born movies, but a lot of action movies do it to where they're cutting, in my opinion, they cut too fast and it kind of makes me wish and kind of <laughs> that they would slow it down so I could see what's happening because I'm like, I don't, who's getting hurt? Who's, ah, uh, what? And it's losing. Oh, I can me. tell. What? Oh, in every movie? Oh, no, in this clip here. It's pretty obvious. Oh, yeah, I'm saying in this clip, it's easy to tell because they're both in the same position. We're just going from, we're just circling the camera around them. But in other ones, I couldn't find the example for it, but they're like flipping around and throwing each other over tables and things like that. And it's not just born movies, it's other movies too. But they have that problem of just cutting so quickly that it's hard to keep up with what's happening, especially if there's a lot of shaky cam, and, you know, there's a lot, they're trying to build that um, intensity and yeah. make it very, very that kinetic energy, make it build up very quickly. But it's just so much going on that it's hard to keep up. 
And I start to lose interest in the scene because of it and just wish that they would have slowed it down a bit so I could tell what was happening. Sometimes it's done just because the shots don't look good enough to hold on to for too long, especially in fight scenes. You know, they're not really punching each other. Sometimes they're like three feet away from each other. So sometimes it's done because of that. But if there's the option to hold on a little bit longer and to kind of have a little bit slower of a flow, I think that a lot of these fight scenes could improve from not having too many cuts because to me, it just starts to get a little over the top and loses me. And, I, and I'm sure it loses a bunch of other people. I've heard other people complain about that kind of thing in action films. I don't know. I like over the top. I like extreme emotion and I like extreme drama and movies and writing and acting. I think it's really awesome and cool. However, yeah, but there's a difference between emotion and acting and, and then overly cutting yeah overly i guess cutting yeah. If they do it too much. yeah lakota's well, talking about when you can't tell what's going on yeah it's no, so that makes fast. Sense. yeah where it's just sloppy and lazy and choppy and over the top and you're confused and you're like what and they're and trying to yeah <laughs> I've, I've heard that sometimes this is an issue like more uh recently because the people that the people that are in these action scenes um, don't necessarily look that convincing uh, when they're fighting, so they tend not. So they tend to cut. They tend to cut in a way that it doesn't show the actual punch being landed. Yeah, uh, that and that can feel very unsatisfying. A, <laughs> yeah. huh? I know it's also that there's um, what is it called? Whenever there's like a stand-in, um, a stunt, a stunt person that's a stunt double. Yeah. And so that could also be why they might cut because you don't want to notice that it's a stunt double and they want to try They've to keep it They've also said in, in many cases that it's back in the day, it was harder to cut compared to now because now it's a lot easier with, with technology and everything digital. So back then they would get a lot more creative and they were, would try different things or they would try training the actors a little more. And now because they have that, sometimes not always but sometimes they can get a little lazy with it to where oh we can just cut it can just make a cut to where it looks like that instead of getting creative and trying a different way yeah so you want to you want to kind of keep a good medium whenever you can whenever you have the option to you don't want to make it too quick because then people don't know what's going on and they get frustrated and yeah. they start to lose interest you don't want to hold on to it for too long because then you start getting bored and you feel like the movie's longer than it is or the scene just goes on forever and you're like gosh is this holy crap we're still in the same scene so um when you're talking about like a slow scene if you think about a film i had a scene where the shots were held for too long and the scene seemed to go on forever there wasn't any important information happening it was just it, them walking through the house, walking upstairs in the room. There's an example where, well, there's multiple, but there's one where he goes to the, it's like the coffee shop or something. And there's two people that go in front of him in order. And that has yeah. nothing to do with the story. It has no significance to the plot. There's no reason for us to hear two people's orders in front of him. And so that shot was way too long and they should have cut that information out and made it go straight to our main character because that's the only thing that matters to us as the audience. We don't care about these other people in this fake movie world that has no significance on the story. You wanna see what the story has, what the emotion of it is and what the significance of each shot, scene and moment is. Um, Makes complete sense with it all and having it all you know seeing it all come together and being part of like every single process it like starts to really like show you how it all clicks together and filmmaking is fun yeah you want to keep in mind that a uh, film's pacing isn't fully reliant on how fast or slow the cuts are though um going back to action films you can have an exciting fast-paced fight without mm -hmm having a lot of cuts, there can be few cuts and it still has that kinetic energy and it still has a lot of stuff going on. It, um, 
it still is exciting even though there's few cuts it doesn't feel like a slow paced film and vice versa you can have a very boring and slow paced scene that just has a lot of cutting going from one person's uh, very uh, extreme close up to another person's medium shot to their close up and it just keeps cutting all over the place but that doesn't mean that it's going to feel fast paced so it's not exactly tied into each other um, it's not reliant of each other. There's, there can be exciting fast paced scenes that have few cuts and there can be very slow paced, boring scenes that have a lot of cuts, but it does tend to um, happen a lot more. There, it, there does tend to be a lot more cuts whenever it's something supposed to be fast paced and intense and a lot more slow cuts when it's supposed to be something either emotional or, um, or just uh, some information to take in. Um, one of the websites, I can't remember which, but they were saying in general, when we're talking about overall, in general, paces of movies are picking up. And you can see that if you go back to the early 2000s and watch a film, and then especially if you go to earlier than that to like the 1980s, you can see the pacing was a lot slower and it wasn't as fast. And pacing is, has been picking up a lot more recently. And there's a few different reasons. Some are the attention spans for people are getting shorter. That's just in general, attention spans are getting a lot shorter because a lot, you know, with phones and the internet and everything, everybody has information at their fingertips and they are constantly going from one thing to the next. And that's why all these websites are coming out with these little short story things. Like if you have social media, now they have these little, um, whatever they call it, where it's the little short stories of just like a few second videos here and there of people because attention spans are just, they're not as, nobody, nobody wants to pay attention to something as long as they used to pretty much. <laughs> is this one of yes the no I mean it depends on the audience some people like are only interested in like you know really fast paced stuff and they get bored really easy and other people really enjoy well obviously we're not talking about everyone but this is just like statistics and things that people are seeing in like studies and this no, is like yeah this is like audience, proven right? fact that people yeah, have gotten shorter fact, attention spans it doesn't attention span. like not every single person but in general yeah. the majority yeah. of people have shorter attention spans now than they used to That's just especially a, with just, newer generations because they grow up with this kind of thing so but okay. also as i was saying audiences now are more accustomed to the way films work and so they can pick up the information more quickly that's back true, when yeah. it was a new a new medium back when film was just coming out people were just seeing it and it was something new and something different so if you showed a movie that was like it is today people would feel like they can't keep up because it has so much stuff going on but now that we have subconsciously been subjected to it for so long and seen all these little the way these films work and the way they sh the show us the stuff they're going for like a dolly in, for instance, when you're dollying in on somebody, we feel like we really need to zone in and pay attention to what's going on because it's telling us something important is happening. So yeah. now you don't need to do it for as long or now you can do a much quicker movement because- Back then yeah. it was more like short stories or even an <coughs> art form and they were introducing it to the public and they were learning about what each movement meant, what type of story yeah. they were trying to tell and how they were trying to tell it. It yeah, and now they like, don't. We don't need as much time to register all the information as as uh, it was as it used to be. Because if yes. you're looking at a painting, you want to yeah. look at it at first, and then you want to start looking at everything in there. And so, film was just like a new way of looking at a bunch of different paintings or a bunch of pictures all at once. And so, audiences at first, you weren't really aware of where to look, and all these filmmakers didn't really know how to focus people's attention or how the people's attention would work when watching it. So those things were learned over the years. And now it's become where filmmakers know if we change the focus and we 
we make the background blurry, then they aren't going to pay attention to the background at all. They're going to pay attention more to whatever is the sharpest in focus. And if we're moving the camera over like this, or if we are dollying into that person's face, they're going to zone in and pay attention to whatever we're dollying into. And all these little tricks and things that I've been learned over the years have made it easier for filmmakers to know when they can, um, how they can display the, that emotion to the audience and, and the audience will be able to pick it up. And because yeah. of this, audiences have become more accustomed to these things. And so they don't need these long takes. They don't need the pacing to be as slow because they can start to pick up and guess where this is going because of all these films that have come out and all these stories that they've heard. Yes, if that makes sense. It's like once you've done, done something or you've seen a lot of story, you understand how story all clicks together your brain. It's like when you first learn something, you have to like slowly do each step, but then they snap together, like as like a, and then instead of like, so say eight steps turns into one. And if you keep doing that, then you like just stack them and you just start getting really good at a whole bunch of stuff. And then for somebody who's never done it, they're like, how, I can't even imagine how you do that, but it's just pulling it apart and snapping it together perfectly. And then, so when you have the like steps, you want to make sure that you're doing everything right before it snaps together. Otherwise you'll like snap together mistakes, if that makes any sense mm -hmm. in the brain, like the synapses, how it yeah. all connects. So it's kind of all interesting. And I find like with, with film and stuff, the more you are exposed to it and around it and like understand how it all flows together on a general note, it's good. And then once you have that, the big picture, then you start getting into all of like the small details. And then that's when it starts turning into a real, really good cinematography. And things yeah, like and that. even when you once you start well, well, for me, once we started studying all this stuff, all these different aspects of filmmaking, I'm starting to notice it a lot more when I'm watching a film. Um, and it doesn't exactly take me out of it; it just makes me notice what they're doing. Um, and, and a lot of people they still don't know a lot of these things because they don't study it as intensively as we have been over the last like year and a half or whatever. But they still have been picking up on a lot of these little tricks and things subconsciously while they're watching films. And a lot of films share a bunch of different information, scenes, emotions, the way that we feel about certain things. Those are pretty much shared across the board. So, well, not scenes, but like the way we feel about stuff is is uh, pretty much shared across the board. So it's uh, Actually, and I, something I subconsciously want... being picked up through your audience. And that's why they don't need as much time to register what is happening. And I have tons you can see of that she's walking from left to right in this image. We don't need the entire walk, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that kind of thing. Um, if you think of like a dramatic scene, the way you pace it will have the audience more or less involved with it. How long you choose to hold on different moments, whether you choose to show the person that is, um, if it's a dramatic scene about a fight, uh, like a, not a physical fight, but just where the two people are getting ready to break up. Then whether you show the person who's speaking or the person who is listening will show your audience who to pay more attention to. Are we supposed to pay more attention to this person's reaction to what that person's saying? Or are we supposed to pay more attention to what that person is saying? How long you hold on different emotions will have the an effect, a different effect on what the audience feels and who they're connected to. When there's two people in a fight, typically a film will choose a side almost, not always. Um, and I think it's good whenever a film can just show both sides and the audience doesn't really know how to feel. But um, some films will kind of side with one or the other, even if it's on accident. If they're showing more of one character and their emotion and their reaction to how they feel to that to that fight, the audience will just automatically connect with that character a little more and maybe agree with them more, even if they wouldn't otherwise, if they were just a third party watching from the outside. But since that camera was showing us that emotion and that person getting really sad about that comment the other person made, we might be more on their side just because we saw how they felt and we feel for them. And yes. so the way you show that, the how long you show it and the pacing that you do will have the audience be more or less involved with each character or with the entire fight in general. Um, if you think about a horror scene, 
the way it's paced is either going to build anticipation and anxiousness for, of the audience so that they get freaked out um, once something, you know, jump scares, usually they'll have a buildup of calm and there'll be anticipation happening for the audience because they feel like something's going to happen. And then all of a sudden something does happen and it's, and it gets them because it's not at the exact moment that they thought maybe. Or a film might immediately have the scare happen and then give the rest of the scene or the rest of the moment, the audience time to kind of come down from that scare and to feel a little more relaxed and calm. Mm -hmm. Or they could also keep them continuously worried that a new scary moment is going to be just around the corner because a scary moment happened and then it's kind of calm for a bit, but then a scary moment happened and then it's kind of calm for a bit, but then a scary moment happened and now it just feels like that's gonna keep happening. So now they're on the edge of their seat, the entire scene. The way that the pacing works will very much affect how the audience feels during that scene, whether they feel like it's okay to, you know, be a little more calmed down and like, okay, the scary moment passed or whether they're waiting for the scary moment to happen, whether they think a scary moment's going to happen at any moment. Those three, the way you pace it, um, affects that. That makes sense. Um, no, it all makes sense, like how it, it all comes together. I'm starting to picture more and more story and then how shots come together where I can visually see it in, in my head and then it's all a matter of like actually just bringing it to life, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, definitely. So it's like training the mind because I've always been able to see story in my brain, but it's now it's like being able to actually take it from there, tangibly write it down in, in the structure that's needed and with each character having their own kind of like character traits and then popping it up into like actual shots and angles and things. It's so interesting, like Dolly and pulling up. Yes. Yeah. And pacing for each genre. And then, you know, breaking the rules just slightly, like mixing two genres. I wouldn't mix more than that ever just stick to too convoluted or sticking to one it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting and then picking and choosing and choices and all of that kind of stuff and what makes a really good story and what makes people like riveted and wanting to see more and target audience it's very interesting same thing for acting it's just bringing the story to life yeah, yeah. And there's so much that goes into it that makes it that's why films a lot of them fail because you know there's so many pieces to it that have to work together for it to work yeah uh, and that's why you know when it's done very very well it's praised because it's a very hard thing to accomplish um and it takes a whole team of people that are like every single person needs to be on the same page so it really comes down to like at the at the end of the day the direction at the top and having all of the pieces come together like you need to be able to, so the director is the one who's going to be making sure that everything looks the way that it needed needs to on the screen right so I guess at the end of the day that's one of the biggest positions because it all falls down on them if it goes well it's on the director if it goes poorly it's on the director and producers and stuff so it's interesting like because like in the actor's position they're just taking direction and doing what they're kind of led to like what they've created from the page in their imagination and then they have to adapt to whatever the director wants mm -hmm. so it's like it, it ends up being really up to um though the director's really final say on how things go together i mean the editor is like you said can only do so much if it looks like shit then the editor can go just like well what do you want me to do <laughs> it looks yeah, like an editor can also ruin a film if <laughs> even if it's done well like a, a lot of movies were almost ruined because of the editor and then the director or the producer had to make the choice to either get a new editor or change the way it was edited because it wasn't working. Um, and so there's been plenty of times like that too. So that's why the edit can really break or make it. If, oh, it, definitely. Has, if it has footage that's decent enough to make it or break it, then the, the editor is where news. that's gonna happen. The good news is, is the footage is like once it's edited, since it's all digital now, it's not, it's not like back in the day when it was like um, film cinema, where if you cut it, that's it. You yeah, know I think I mean? they made copies back in the day just in case so that they could have- Yeah, them. but it would be a way bigger deal. Now yeah, it sucks definitely. and it's inconvenient, but it's not- um, like Now it's actually deal. something that, I think Priscilla already said it, but one, one of the things, one of the notes I had was that 
edits are so easy to be done now because we're all you know digital editing you can edit something you can cut it and then you can cut it and cut it and cut it and then see what it looks like that we don't even think about it as much anymore but whenever you were thinking about cutting back when you were using actual film stock you had to make sure that that cut was probably going to excuse me you had to make sure that that was where you wanted to cut mm -hmm. at least you know you had to you had to pay attention to it more and, and think about it before you did it because it was a longer process to have to cut it and seam it together and view it, it than it is it. now because now you can cut it look at it in your same in the same moment pretty much then uh, back then it, it was a bit more intensive and a bit more of a uh, process so oh definitely definitely was a way bigger of a deal now it's just like with the technology and the access that we have to all of them you know equipment and stuff it becomes not easy. I mean, you have to know what you're doing, but it's just, it's a little bit more forgiving, but then it comes down to time and energy. So it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, you still want to do it right the first time, but it's, there's a little bit more forgiving if you don't. Yeah. And what they, um, what the person was saying, I, like I said, I can't remember who, I think it was one of the websites, but they were saying that the like editors now, they like when they're new, they tend to over edit, tend to over cut it because they don't have to think about it as much as they used to like and so you might think that seven cuts here is good but then it turns out to be a little bit too choppy or jumpy or not really needed so that is why learning about it and kind of studying when to edit is good but you also are going to have to practice and, and get better if you're trying to actually edit your own stuff or if you're trying to um, become an editor you're definitely going to have to just get a feel for it by doing it but but kind of knowing these things is good especially for directors screenwriters to kind of get a sense of how maybe they should start thinking about the edit process before they even begin writing or before they begin shooting so that they can incorporate these things no it makes sense if you have a base like you don't have to be you know perfect at every single area of film to be able to write a good film you just have to know enough if yeah. that makes any sense because like at the end of the day it comes down to so when I'm thinking about filmmaking and we're doing all these things I'm trying all these things it's like I'm already starting to pick exactly what I love to do you know what I mean doing in like if you pick a couple areas to get really really good at have a general good sense of like how to do the basics of every area or like mm -hmm. understanding how it all comes together but as you grow bigger, you'll see like each department might have like, they might have eight grips or 10 grips on a film. So it's just like in that one department. So it's just like, there's so much like every like specifics that you have to learn for each position that it's impossible. I would say nearly impossible for one person to get good at every single position to the maximum that um, somebody would be um, focused on one position. Does that make, I guess if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, that's, so it's just like, I yeah, think one man does it all kind of thing. It doesn't. Not in film, not in work. cinema. Yeah. I mean, unless you're doing something like music videos, wedding photography. Even then I would say like, it's really hard to be a one man band in the. It's a little easier. Cause there's so many parts that require different stuff. mindsets and different skill sets. Um, definitely but that's cinema, why i like to just know the general no. like movies you yeah. cannot it's like you are looking at like 80 people on a on an indie <laughs> right it's like you can't 80 people to one like this this just not it's impossible again like small scale like anything that's like five minutes or under you can man one or two or three man band it but um like if like for music videos and stuff, because then it's just like you just have like your you like oftentimes like a three lighting setup or a two point three point lighting setup or something else or another type of small lighting setup, um, and then you would have like the camera and then the actors and you can kind of like make it work with just a few people. But you know, actual movies, no. So I think it's good if everyone starts to really hone down on a few areas to get really good at like any other. Yeah. And you just get, and it's a repetition. Yeah. Yep. Repeat, 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 repeat a thousand times and then a thousand more. And then you see, you see people look and go, how does that look seamless? Practice, my friends.
and yeah, because they take years to do it. All right. Well, I'm going to go back to um, some of my other notes Fine. on editing the pacing. Um, another note is longer shots can also be done where it doesn't have to necessarily slow down the um, the flow. As long as there's like camera movement that's creating new frames within the same shot, making it visually interesting and different, and it's maintaining that high quality, you can do a very long shot and it still doesn't feel as long. If you've ever seen, um, I know, I don't know exactly what movie does this, but I've seen several do it where you're following the character, they're going inside of a building and doing something and then they're coming out and the camera's pretty much just panning the entire time to the left or the right, following the character, go from one thing to another. And then they're following them down the next street and they're turning. The camera's now being a doll, a follow dolly and it's going straight towards the character as they're walking and they're saying, hey, to different people. Plenty of different shots you'll see like that where it's very long, but it does work. It doesn't automatically mean that it's gonna slow it down. It might still feel very, um, the rhythm and the pacing might still feel pretty quick based on how much new information and new framing is happening within that shot. Uh, wide shots, establishing shots, and shots with a lot of information, usually you typically wanna hold on to them a bit longer and, and view them for a bit longer so that the audience has time to register all of that information. Whereas close-ups, insert shots, and shots with very little information, they can be much quicker because it's it's easy to register that there's a knife in somebody's pocket if you're just doing a close up of a knife. It's easier to register that we're looking at somebody's face if there's no, um, if there's not a lot of emotion happening. If it's just one little reaction that you want to capture, you don't have to hold on to that shot for too long. But if we're showing the entire room, if it's a new setting, if it's a new place that you might wanna hold on to for a bit longer just so that the audience has a little bit more time to uh, register everything. And when I say like a bit longer, it could be just a few frames longer. It doesn't need to be like, you know, 10 seconds or something. It can be however long or short, but it just typically means that the stuff with more information, it's gonna be at least a few frames longer, if not a second maybe or more longer than the shots that are just showing something very simple or something close up. Um, another note, when you are editing, you typically do not want to cut from a moving shot to a still shot for the flow and the movement because you want the movement to come to an end before cutting to that still shot. Otherwise, it's going to feel jarring or a little weird or maybe even cheap if you're watching a camera movement go from one side to the other, up, down, tilting, whatever it's doing, if you cut in the middle of that to something that's just a still shot, it is a bit more off-putting and jarring than if we're watching that camera movement and then it stops before cutting to the still shot. Okay, this isn't a hard and fast rule. I've seen films that do it where it works. It just depends on what's happening in the scene. It could be that the movement is the movement of the character the character could be stopping um, and then it cuts to a still shot of that character. But if you're showing movement of a character and movement of a camera and then you're cutting to a still shot and there's we didn't show them stopping, it just tends to be a little weird and messes up the flow. So if you're going yeah. for like a nice seamless flow, then that's something you kind of want to avoid most of the time. Is like a judge stopping? What? You to keep flow, you want to avoid Joe stopping. You want to avoid like if you have a character and the camera moving, you want to avoid cutting to a shot that is just a still shot. So if the character is walking from left to right and then and the camera was following them, panning to the left or the right, you don't just want to cut to something where everything's still because it'll feel weird. Because the last yeah. moment we saw they were moving. So if they're still in the next shot, it just it kind of messes that up, the continuity and the flow of it. That makes sense. Another thing is um, for emotion, another thing that a editor can do, depending on the resolution of the footage, if the resolution of the footage was shot at 4K or 6K or above, they can definitely add a little bit of slight 
digital camera movement, like dollying in. Well, I guess I don't know if it'd be called dollying in, punching in, punching or zooming out, zooming in. I'm not sure what you would call it for digital, but it's the same thing as if you're dollying in on set. What was it? I would call it a zoom. A zoom? Okay. Okay, yeah. So you can either zoom in or out, or you can do slight pans or tilts and that can help add emotion to it especially if you're dollying into a character while they're speaking even if it's just very slight and very subtle um, that's something an editor can do with if there's enough information in the shot with higher resolutions um, for their for the quality to maintain if the quality drops too far it's going to look weird and be ugly and not work but if the quality is good enough and it matches the rest then they can add a few little slight movements just to make it a little more impactful when somebody's giving an impactful speech for instance and there was no actual dolly on the uh on the set i can just slowly zoom in while the person's talking to make it a bit more impactful and to give that same feeling as you would from a dolly in from yeah. the camera moving on set <clears throat> That's all I have for that stuff. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that? Not at the moment. It all, it all, it's, it makes more sense once like I've done, once you've done like hands on a little bit, like learning the basics, then hands on a little bit, then diving in more. It like, it makes sense. And I think it just comes down to just understanding it and doing it, if that makes any sense. Cause then you just get damn good. Yeah. That's just, in my opinion, that's what, what anything that's tangible, like hands on. If you just like understand the basics, put in like a lot of thought and care. Like if you're trying to get a good, you know, shot list, really taking the time to stand in the space that you're going to shoot in and visualize it all so that it lines up. If you're doing editing, really understand the plot points of the story so that you can cut it in places that actually make sense. And taking that extra little bit of time to really understand. My thinking though, and the, the biggest thing is like you spend all this time like thinking and then the director wants already has like the specific way that they want it done. So it's like in between, like it's like being able to understand the way that you would. Put well, you don't want to ever, if you're an editor, you don't want to, unless the director has given you specific notes for different parts of the edit, you don't want to think about what the director would want in that spot because it'll hinder the creative aspect and make the make the project a little worse because you don't really know what they're going to think and sometimes the director doesn't know what they're going to want no that's back. true unless so. like like you said unless they came off with specific notes beforehand then yeah. yes give it your best shot um to make it like what you think it'll be good and oftentimes they'll be like wow that's really good sometimes they go no i don't like it at all change it completely and sometimes they'll just tweak a few things and i find it like interesting and really fun to like the more people you work with that are like involved, the more fun it is. If that makes any sense, it can be. It can also be a uh, as, long it, as, as long as it's cohesive and everyone's working together. Yes. Um, well, as long as everyone like cares and isn't step like, as long as for me the people can have the weirdest personalities or quirkiness or even be snappy or whatever. As long as they don't have ill intentions or trying to sabotage or do something stupid, I'm cool with pretty much everyone. That's the only like behavior I can't stand is when people just try to make you look bad so that they can get the job. Anything like that, I have no tolerance for. Everything else, like you could be the weirdest, quirkiest person in the world. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. That's a great, we create more better stuff. Yeah. But that's, yeah. But most times on like professional film sets, there's no room for stupidity. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, good. definitely. Everybody has to be in the zone and ready to go with their specific things. Uh, does and anyone like, else have anything to add or um, questions or anything? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you had talked about like pacing and, um, I, I bring up Quentin Tarantino a lot because he's a, a prime yeah. example. It's like, he's not an editor, but you can see like his style is there. Um, he holds on, he does a lot of, um, like if you watch any of his films, even his, his, well, even his newer stuff, like he is known for holding on to a shot and you had given that, um, that general rule of like two to three seconds per shot, which is the norm. Four to six. <laughs> four to six. Yeah. Four yeah. to six is the norm. But Quentin, if you watch any of his movies, like 
it, and even in his dialogue, like, you know, he's known for having scenes that go way over the norm. And it's the same thing in his editing as well. Like he'll hold on to a shot for a minute, even more. And, um, but I, I, I'm noticing, cause like I study his films and um, he has a technique of a way of like just capturing your attention um, with dialogue and interesting characters and stuff like that. It's more of a charm, I think, that comes with it that allows you to be able to break those rules. Well, they're not really rules, but, you know, to go against it and and just to not do the norm. Because, mm-hmm. like, if you, if you watch, like, he really does a lot of two shots. He really doesn't do the over the shoulder or any of that stuff. He doesn't do that too often. Like, it takes a while for him to break into that. Like he'll do a lot of two shots or a lot of like just medium shots with like multiple people in it. Yes. Before he mm-hmm. starts to go into any of these close ups. So like, you know, we're giving you like you guys are talking about, you know, all these um, standards, which is cool. But, you know, there's a you know, not everybody can be Quentin Tarantino. That doesn't mean that it's OK to like, oh, man, Quentin Tarantino does it. I can do it. That's not what that means. Like he's. <laughs> Exception. Find your own. Ooh. My thinking is like, look at, be inspired by all these people that are like really cool and really good, but find your own style. If that makes any sense, because like yeah. your unique way of like viewing things and creative process will bring something completely different. And the more like, for me, what I find so interesting about like Quentin Tarantino or other like producers, directors, actors that have like a specific pacing and style to all of their work is that exactly it. It's the uniqueness of it. When somebody just copies something, um, it's not quite the same. Although when people are really pro at copying things all the time, like that's a skill set is in it. That's a different type of skill set that is also really impressive for just being that, if that makes any sense. Like if somebody's like really good at copying other people's style and just that's like when you get it, yeah. That's like well, yeah, that's 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 practice. That's you know, I I'm doing that with Kill Mary. Like to be able to mimic but, yeah. another character, it's it's pretty cool. But you know, it's a different skill set. It's not quite the same as like creating these stuff like out of your own head, but it's a different type of like a different skill set, and they're both I would say equally useful, if that makes any sense. You need people who are more original and come up with their own styles, and you need people that are great. At like, so I would say it's kind of the same as everything else. Like you got the rules, and then you know that what they are, so that you can either go against it and break it, or you can go ahead and go with it. You just gotta know, understand what that means. Typically speaking, these things are the way they are because of a lot of studying and like seeing how people react to different films. And, you know, they didn't like how slow this felt. Why did it feel slow? Let's delve into it and figure that out. It doesn't mean that it can't happen. Like uh, Brian's saying, like, that doesn't mean that you can't go against the, the, the group, the group mind of how it works. And it doesn't mean it's not going to work if you go against it. It just means that you got, there's, there are these things that you want to know about so that you know if you're breaking it. You don't want to accidentally break the stuff and then your movie's crap and you don't really know why and you don't know how to fix it. That's why it's good to know about these things. But if you want to go against the grain, go ahead and get, go ahead because you never know. Yeah, stuff I, that's quote unquote not supposed to work might work perfectly well for whatever you're doing. I think go wherever you have the most passion because that's where you're going to just, if you are interested in something and find it interesting, that's what's going to, because it all comes down to like being good at something comes down to practice I mean there's a few things that like take a little bit more like natural talent so mixing the two what you like naturally are good at and inclined to do and what you're very interested in doing and if you mix those two together then you'll start to um that's the direction in my opinion is the direction that you should go in Mm -hmm. also what happens is a lot of times Uh, these uh, editing techniques have been used so much for a specific genre, right? And uh, these editing techniques, uh, they get associated with uh, genre, right? And what Mm -hmm. happens is people who are looking at that uh, genre, they they have a pre-conscious mindset to expect that kind of uh, editing style. So you know, over the years when some 
uh, movies or some directors or some editors kind of um, become popular uh, you know, with their films in specific uh, genre, people are used to it. They expect uh, a certain norms or certain, you know, basic style of uh, the genre. So in that case, if you do anything diverted from that specific cutting style, it may actually come and, you know, hurt you in, in the long run because people are, uh, people's expectations are set yeah, because so when- of... Yeah. yeah, and you know, so that 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 thing is also there. Of course, within that uh, you know baseline, you do want to be creative in your own ways as to how you want to bring in innovation or creative uh, artistic uh, style to that oh. editing, yes. where uh, you have a mix and uh, match of both. But uh, uh, you know, a lot of people can kind of uh, want to be you know uh, like editing. Uh, uh, like somebody who is uh, a popular editor, right? Because he plays with emotions and uh, cuts the scenes in such a way that he brings the emotions out. So using that style to bring the emotions out, um, there are different ways to bring the emotions out, but uh, you know, one of the ways would be to use that uh, technique. So in yeah. that case, uh, yeah, there's nothing you know uh, wrong in using the technique to basically get the emotions out. No, Because the end of the story, end of the, end of the day, it is basically what, uh, how good you flow the story and what mm-hmm. emotions you bring into the story. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah I, would definitely. Like, I would like to add um, also with that, like if you're working on like big sets and stuff, do it the way, like you said, the expected way most of the time. Cause at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's a job, like it's, you have to be really good and do it across the board. Like, so if you have like a whole bunch of different sets that you're working on and stuff, understanding and doing it the expected way is a great way to like consistently meet quality standards and what everybody wants. But then also don't be afraid to have your own style because you might find um, some people that you work with might want something completely different than the typical way. And you're having your own style that you've been practicing on, on the side might actually come in handy and they may go, wow, that's so cool. We're doing that. Um, or even for your own projects or, or whatever else. But but being able to do it the exact way that most people expect is what's going to, you know, keep you working with jobs um, consistently. But with the creative practice, I'd say don't be afraid to have your own style or break norms a little bit. Um, just know when to use it and when not to, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and have a reason. Just know about it and have a reason and have and know that you're going to have these like if you're holding on a long shot just know that there needs to be something happening otherwise it's going to feel slow paced so whether if the action inside of it is happening quickly then okay if you're having a bunch of camera movement that's changing around the the framing that will work too but just know that typically speaking if you're trying to be holding on a long shot where it doesn't have a bunch of new information or it's not an emotion or there's nothing really there it's just going to make for the most part, your audience feel a little more bored because it's a little more slow paced. They might not get bored, but they'll definitely feel the slower pace. So that is just something you have to keep in mind. Doesn't mean you don't have to, doesn't mean you have to stick to a certain, you know, oh no, it needs to be four to six seconds each time. Otherwise it doesn't work. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means the generalities of everything make those things, those those quote unquote. I think, yeah, rules. being really it's good at, being really good at the generality and the way like everyone kind of expects you to do it is great because then you could just come in do 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 but then again like no not not in editing you can't just no you you follow the story like you can't like you you guys you keep talking about like you know not doing it the way other people are doing it but these aren't really like it's not the same as writing a scene a certain way or making sure that this film is 90 minutes or 120 minutes it's more it's just like these subconscious things that we feel when we're watching things like a camera movement generally speaking a camera movement a dolly in it's going to make the audience focus on that thing more it's going to make it seem more important so if the thing isn't important at all why is there a dolly in you know and that's just like and, and it can be a movie that does that that it doesn't matter and they're doing it on purpose, 
but it just is a typical rule that that is there because generally speaking, the audience is going to feel like that scene is should be more important for whatever reason because that dolly movement yeah, is moving. I would say when it comes to editing, it's like oh, you can have your particular style or you can choose to cut a specific way to enhance an emotion or to keep it on a specific way, uh, try to get a feeling across. You, you can play around like that. But there are, when it comes to editing, there are certain rules as far as like capturing emotion, timing, um, feeling, um, tension, building tension that are, are kind of not set in stone, but are pretty, um, the word I'm looking for, essential and kind of, um, that's what I mean. What is the I think it's also like uh, Brian was giving the example of Quentin Tarantino and his films and how he does two shots and he holds them for a long time. But it's because the dialogue is going back and forth between the characters and a lot of people really like the characters and their dialogue and their back and forth really funny or it's really interesting and different. So that is what's holding the scene together where you can hold that long shot, where you can do just a two shot and it still works compared to a movie where it's a regular conversation between two more um, like typical characters that are just having a regular conversation back and forth. If yeah, it's the just kind a two of shot, style will really um, rule as far as how you do the edit and what choices you make. Right, so you can definitely get it to work. It just depends on what you have and your story. But just typically speaking, these these things are there for a reason. Is what yeah, I was but that's what I mean. Like when you when you do anything like editing, boom, whatever it is. I'm not saying don't put an F on or don't think about it. What I mean is like once you get really good at something, it feels like it, it's like all those synapses click together and you are paying attention. But it should feel like. Do, 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 do most of the time it shouldn't be like um really stressful because you know exactly what you're doing and you're just like oh yeah fix this do do do, 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 do. It's, it's not like um you're thinking about it like very um you're putting a lot of focus in it but you're making it seem easy it's like any you know what i mean once you get really good at something you just like oh yeah i know what you mean because yeah, so if you watch you a know, professional like, editor they can edit things and like super quickly and it seems like they're like, just, chop, 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 yeah. and they're doing it really quickly they're still thinking they just hone their skills really quickly. If you watch an artist who's yeah. done it for a long time, they can draw a picture in a few seconds. And then they're like, a lot of them done said, exactly. Yeah, a so lot of them said, easy. Yeah. yeah, it went down to instinct. And after you do it for a while, you just have the instinct. Okay, time to cut. Okay. Yes. Uh, and that's dog. what I mean. In, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad place to be and being able to maintain that for like, at that level consistently and constantly is great because it's just like again that's what you want to be it's like at that do to do and then that's when you can go once you've maintained that then you can maybe take things to a new level or try new things or like start playing with your own style but get yourself to that point where it's just like oh this is what we do here and it's like easy relax and um connections in the brain it shouldn't feel like a struggle it should just feel like flow and easy like, oh, this is what we do here. This is what we do there. Like, you're not even breaking a sweat. It's like people that could just drop down and do 50 push-ups, like, and they're like not even doing a sweat. <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, no problem. It's just like, it's not easy. It's just uh They've just consistent. done it for so long. Yeah, yeah, you just get really good at stuff and then you make it look easy. Um, and I think the it's good to like really praise and um, be appreciative of people that have decided to, spend a lot of time getting really good at stuff because it, it it isn't easy and to make it look that easy is it's it's nice to just especially for them too because like once you do something for a while you forget how much effort it took to get there because it's just easy now mm -hmm. so it's just like it's nice instead of being like oh you make it look so it's not that hard like i hate that attitude it's just like well then you practice too like we can both do it like i don't care yeah. <laughs> you know All right, i'm gonna move on to the next thing which is just these are more general rules of thumb um there's obviously there's not going to be any hard and fast rules with this at all because it's going to depend on each project um but it's just how long does editing take how long should you maybe schedule or think about for that post-production process or um you know, like when you're thinking about the budget, you got to think about how long it might take for your project and how much you might need to pay 
and you want to get it as accurate as you can. So these are some general rules of thumb to kind of get it close to that. Um, the, let me see, this was from, some of these are from Cyber Film School, which is A, and the, the website. And they say that the general rule of thumb is about one, it's gonna take about one hour for one finished minute of a rough cut. It's gonna take about one hour of editing for um, one finished minute of a fine cut. So just in the picture edit, you might have two hours for every finished minute of that project. So if it's a five minute project, the editor mm -hmm. might spend around 10 hours working on it. If it's a feature film, then you just do the math and you figure out that it's, um, what is it like if it was 90 minutes let's say or let's say 100 to make it easier then it's going to be about 200 hours so if they're working 40 hours a week that would be about five weeks of editing just to get that picture edit done 20 hours for the rough cut and 20 hours for the fine cut i'm sorry 100 hours for the rough cut 100 hours for the fine cut so 200 hours total um, another general rule of thumb is it's about one hour, and this is more for the videos, like creating a video, but one hour per minute for making a sound effects and music track if you already have access to the music and the sound effects. Not if you have to do the composing and not if you have to actually create the sound effects, and it's obviously going to take a lot longer. But if, you're, if you already have access to a sound effects library or something like that and you're already using it, and you're maybe using some pre-made music, then uh, creating that track would take about another hour for every minute of finished um, film. Again, the, um, they also said that it's, they're taking into account a shooting ratio, which shooting ratio is just how many minutes, how many hours of shooting have you done compared to how many minutes are going to be used or how many hours are going to be used <clears throat> in the project itself. So if you have like a ratio of 10 to one, then you're shooting 10 hours and you're only using one hour of that footage. And films will have a lot more than that, depending on the budget level. Like the higher budgets will have usually a higher ratio and the lower budgets will have a smaller ratio so that there's less footage, there's less storage, and there's less time in the edit. Because the more footage there is, the more the editor has to go through to figure out what's usable, what's not, and to start selecting what they want to use. So they're yeah. saying um, the general rules of thumb for like the one hour for one minute of footage is they're basing it on a 10 to one ratio or less. So 10 hours of footage for the one hour that might be used or 10 minutes of footage shot for one minute that might be used. And comprehensive media, C in the website, a, um, they use a ratio of how many hours it will take to, to how many completed minutes of footage they have edited as well. But um, they're talking more about like videos and documentaries, but they're saying that four factors are determined when they're making their own, when they're thinking about their budgets and stuff. The complexity of the script, that's always gonna determine many different things in the edit. If it's, a, if it's visual effects heavy, of course, it's going to take a lot longer than that to edit that together and to get it all right compared to something that is just a person in a, in a scene or a person looking in one thing. And how many shots there are would also affect that. The type of footage. So because they're talking more about videos and things, it would be talking about stuff like music videos or if it's an interview or things like that. That would also affect it. So obviously, if it's a film, that's going to affect it a lot. If it's a short film, it's a film, feature film, or if it's just a video, it's going to be very different. The amount of footage that there is, that would be that shooting ratio. 
and then the um, length of the project. So how long it's expected to be. If you have a 90 page film, then you are expecting to have 90, um, <clears throat> 90 minutes of a finished project is the general rule of thumb with the, with the script. So each page equals a minute. So the longer your script, the longer, the, the more amount of footage you are going to have. And then the bigger the ratio, the shooting ratio, the yeah. more amount of footage you're going to have for the editor to look through before they can find the usable stuff and start editing around it. Um, comprehensive Media, the website, they said that it could be about a two to one ratio for a simple project or 10 to one for more complex stuff um, where, and their two to one, their ratio is based on how many hours it's going to take to edit compared to the minute, the minutes of film that are complete. So two to one would be two hours for one minute of film and 10 to one would be 10 hours for one minute. Mm -hmm. Again, if you look at that and you think about a feature film, if it's a 10 to one and you have a 100 minute feature film, then you have um, a thousand hours. That's a lot of hours. Edit. If it's 10 to one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the longer your project, the more the longer it's going to take and the more footage you have, the more long it's going to the longer it's going to take for your editor to, to sift through it. And the rest of the rules of them I kind of have on mine. So the rest of the rules of them I wrote here based on just different things that are a general rule of thumb in, in production and things like that. One script page equals one minute of screen time. So that of yep. course varies very much based on what is in that script. And sometimes a script might just say they fight, which is clearly not gonna take one minute. It's gonna take a lot more than that. But the way that scripts are um, formatted are based on trying to get it down to about one minute per page. And that's why You'll have, um, if you're writing a feature film, they want to have it be at least like 90 pages or more <clears throat> to be able to be called a feature film script because one page roughly equates to one minute of uh, screen time. Makes sense. Another general rule of thumb you'll hear is one script page generally equals about one hour of production on set. And again, this is different depending on what is in that script. If it's a fight scene, of course, it's not gonna be one hour of production on set. They might spend the entire day or three days or a week on that one page. But if it's just a normal script page, generally speaking, it will be about an hour of production on set. Makes sense. And we're talking about editing. Again, this is back to about one minute edited equals about one to one and a half hours of editing. That's just generally speaking. That's picture editing, not exactly the rest. When we're talking about one minute of composed music, that is about one and a half to two hours of composing. So if you want to have music run through your entire project, you would factor in those numbers and try to figure out the general sense of how long it might take for post-production to get that music done and how much it might cost. Yeah. Um, one minute of composed music with an orchestra, like a big fancy orchestra doing all the music for you, if you were gonna get that, you can equate that to be about 20 to 25 hours of composing for each minute of composed music. Um, when we're talking about lower budget indie sets, one script page might also equal about $1,000. So you wanna factor that into the budget. Um, and then when we're talking about how many pages get shot a day when they're talking about Hollywood movies, they generally shoot about one, one page per day. They can, they can afford that. Um, yeah. You know, some will shoot more, some will shoot less. Again, these are general rules of thumb. Well-funded independent films shoot about four to five pages a day and low and micro budget films shoot about eight or more a day. That's crazy. I think because they got to get that that stuff done because they don't have the money to keep 
paying people each day of uh, each day of shooting. Makes sense. It all comes together. You start to get really, I don't know how to like say it, but like you just really get hone in and get super good at everything. If that makes any sense. It's like simplifying, like any artist, like it's just, you just get good. I don't know how to explain. Yeah. Yeah. It just, just takes time. And so yeah, just um, pick two or three and just like get like that's my suggestion for every single person is just pick an area and get damn good at it and understand like 10 different ways to do it so that if somebody asks you can be like oh yeah no problem we'll do it this way oh yeah no problem we'll do it that way if yeah it's like yeah, that, that's my 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 thinking is like you want to be that good all the time yeah that's how you work consistently sorry i just uh and not worry so and then and then understanding like when it comes to money and stuff understanding how much things cost what the weight of everything is and understanding way to like keep yourself in the in in the market too because you would now ever want to under budget yourself in your skills you don't ever want to over budget yourself in your skills like i've heard stories of like you know companies going under because they decided to go way way above like market value and same thing you'll yeah. go under if you go way below market value because they won't yep. take you seriously so you need to just you know no no be in the pocket in relative like with everybody else yeah and so this this all goes way more with like uh, budgeting stuff because um these are like the general rules of thumb where you want to start off with that kind of thing um and that like like sarah's saying like there are projects the reason why we want to like look at this kind of stuff and why you want to come up with a budget is because a lot of projects won't factor in post-production. And if you look at it, it's a lot of time that goes into it. Just in the picture edit alone, one minute of edited film is about one to one and a half hours of editing. Yeah. If you have a 100 minute film, that's a 100 hours to 150 hours of editing just for the picture. And then you think about all the rest of the stuff that goes into post-production like sound and music and color grading and visual effects and if you don't factor that stuff in it becomes very expensive very fast yes so, and you want to and, and of course if you have like a hard sequence to edit it's going to take even longer than that one in the one and a half hour average so you want to just kind of factor these things in while you're thinking about it the reason why low and micro budget films have to go about eight pages per day is because they're they're trying to follow this general rule of thumb of one page equals one minute of screen time. I mean, not that one page equals one hour of production. So if that were true for every single page, um, then eight pages would be at about an eight hour day, which is doable, but you have to set up everything and different problems arise. And so you want to factor in more than that if you can, and if you have the budget for it, then you start moving up to, well, we'll try to shoot four to five pages a day. That way we can really hone in on it. And then if you get up to the Hollywood budget level, you can say, well, we're gonna focus as much as we want and do one page per day. Even though generally speaking, it might take about an hour, we might factor in that we wanna take it, we wanna shoot it from all different angles. And that is also where that shooting ratio comes in and why Hollywood feature films and things like that will have a much higher shooting ratio where they'll have a lot more footage, even though they don't need it. The reason why Zack Snyder was able to take out all the scenes that was um, created by the, what's the other director that was directing uh, Justice League? Does anyone remember who took over for Zack Snyder in Justice League? Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon. So the reason why he was able to take out all those scenes and not change the movie, I mean, and, and change the movie without like completely shortening it, I think he, he made it even longer, is because they shot so much stuff that he was able to use the stuff that was already shot. I think they let him do a few pickups um, and reshoots, but they didn't let him do too much with it. So he already had that footage that. there. He already had those scenes and those moments, and he was able to take that and create basically a very different film on that stuff. And it's because they have so much extra footage to use. So I on a that. large Hollywood budget film, they might have these different moments and scenes that 
are good that don't even that they might not even be bad but they just don't add anything to the story and they cut them out on a lower budget film and micro budget you have to start thinking about getting it done in time and being able to do it in the budget when you have a with, much smaller budget so well, with the to, center, but there's also the fact that he uh joss whedon reshot a bunch of them and um yeah just to be annoying really um so there's that as well but yeah the edit made a huge difference the color grading the aspect ratio completely different story yeah and i think that um when you have people that are very specific about what they want you to do and stuff i actually really appreciate that when you like step in and they're like this is exactly what we want and need it's like so easy because then you exactly know you then you hear bring your creative juices to fill in in the blanks mm -hmm. i yeah i'm like that that kind of person that just really appreciates direct and um like, hey, do it like this. Or like, we want it to look kind of like this. And then you can like, when somebody sends you that, then you can go, hmm, okay. And then add your own creative flair to it a little bit. But like, at least then you have like some sort of, yeah, it's great. I love it all. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah I mean, in interesting. Yeah, the general rules of thumb, um, like I said, they're general, they're just rules of thumb. So you don't really, don't, don't follow it exactly. Always leave some buffer room and think about what actually you are shooting this is just for the general overall sense of those kinds of things for editing alone um another another thing is you if the if your editor is working full time on it it's going to take about five to 16 weeks for that picture edit so yeah. that's some you want to factor in that time and you want to factor in that budget and then um Another one is like, you know, um, post-production can be anywhere from like six months to a year or more, depending on what needs to be done. So mm -hmm. that is also something you want to factor in when you're making something. The longer your project, the more complex it is, the more, you know, if it needs visual effects and things like that, the longer it's going to take to get done. Yeah. And even if it's very, um, what was that? Patience is key in being able to, to build that. And that all comes down to like, once you understand on a small scale, how time, then you just like expand it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I'm talking more like for this, it's talking more of like budget cool. and scheduling more than anything. No, that makes sense. And like on, on like on the grand scheme, no, that all that all makes sense. Like how like, you know, the more complex it is, the longer it takes and stuff in post and, and all these other things. And I think that that's... Um, really good to know but I, I i what i meant was like when you have the complex you could take something like small like a music video or like a small 10 page mini uh movie and then it's just like in all the working posts they just kind of expand when you're doing something that's way more complex does that make sense yeah yeah if do you understand what i'm saying it's like um understanding how to do a five point scene you, it's like easier to turn it into 25 being able to do those five points very well then boom you can expand it and make it more com if, if that makes any sense yeah like if you have the if you have those moments that you're able to either cut out or put in then you can expand or you can make the scene a little more mm -hmm. uh, a little smaller if you, that's where like editing especially on larger budget productions comes in to play a lot more too is that you have this good footage, you have these good takes, you have this good acting that has these different takes and maybe they said different lines each time or maybe they just reacted differently each time to keep it fresh. Some actors will give you a different emotional take and a different beat to it, a different rhythm to their lines. It's still the same line, but they do it a little bit different where it can still cut together well in continuity, but it has a that different feel to it. I know that the guy who played the Hobbit um, and well, in the Hobbit, he played Bilbo Baggins. Yes. I don't. Martin Freeman. Yeah, I know he's done it. I've seen him in the behind the scenes on a lot of his his other projects and, and that as well. He gives a different take each time. So they the editor on that actually has to figure out which take they like best and which one works best with that scene overall. So that can actually become a, uh, 
it can actually make it editing a little bit more complex because instead of having five bad takes and one good take, and so, okay, obviously I'm going to use that good take. They have a bunch of good takes and they have a bunch of different takes. So they had to figure out which one works best for that scene. And then other also, because it's that shooting ratio, they have so much more footage. Sometimes they have scenes, which you'll see on any DVDs that have behind the scenes and these deleted scenes. They have to delete the scenes out because they just aren't working for the overall film. Scenes are great. They might even have visual effects and stuff like that that are working for it. But once they put it all together in that final piece, they just take it out because it's not working with the rest of it. And so when you're editing, um, that comes into play as well. But when you're editing on a lower budget film, it's usually the, not the opposite, but it's usually you don't have as many choices and uh, with the performances anyway, with the differences in that. And you don't have as much footage to work through, which is good but also gives you less control and creative freedom to do whatever you want with it. So that's where you have to become a little bit better at creative problem solving as well to figure out how you're going to make that scene work if it's not working. You said like if you have shot stuff that looks like crap and things like that, the editor can still take it and make it work. If the performance is bad, we even talked about this I think last week, you, the editor can, can cut around some things. They can not show the person while they're speaking. They can do a few different tricks to make it their performance come out better. And on Hollywood mm -hmm. films, it happens as well. Um, you know, every film, you'll have the editor be able to kind of adjust the performance and make it a little bit better by timing it because you're retiming everything. You can cut them off on ums and yes. ohs and all these other things where they're not needed. You can also um you can it makes sense. cut away from them when their facial expression isn't the best there's different things they, they can do to make it work so editors have a lot of control over those things and the higher up you go the more options you have and the more yes. control it is but the longer it's going to take and the more expensive it's going to become because of that which is why you want to get in my opinion and that's why I use the five to 25 ratio thing. Make sure that it's seamless. Whatever you're doing is seamless on a small scale, because then when you, it's like, if you are really seamless on a small scale, what's going to happen if you take it to a bigger scale is that you just expand each part and add more details, but it's, you're more likely to have it all come together perfectly that way and it costs less money to practice and do get really good on a small scale that when you put it all together on a large scale then it just like seems seamless and your first project might even be pretty good so um and that that would be really awesome um just like you know thinking on these aspects and things like that um yeah does that make you guys understand what i'm saying yeah yeah, yeah i think that's because then you won't feel so bad. Like it only feels bad, like six months. That's a long time or like to like really put into something in post-production. But like, if you already know that at the end of the day, it might not, it's going to turn out pretty good because you know that once you've expanded these ideas and you know, your team and everything else, you know, it's just going to come together and it's, you have total trust and faith that it'll all just click together and you might have some pieces that aren't perfect or the exact way that you envision, but it'll still, no matter what, it's probably the likelihood that it'll be pretty good is high because you understand, like, it just clicks. It's yeah. like once you understand something, like, you've done it on, yeah. Oh, yeah it might, no. like, again, things do fail, but they're less likely to fail if you are just, like, consist like consistently phenomenal at it. Like, you just get good all the time. And then sometimes you have, like, really, really amazing but your status quo is great or good. It's yeah. just what you do. And so bringing it back to this, it's like you want to make sure that the you budget in all these things and you schedule them in so that you're giving your editor enough time and enough. Yes. Um, if you know, like the, and you have enough budget for them to be able to have that time to edit it correctly. Because if you give them, if you, give them something super short, you only have a week or two weeks to edit, then they're going to be making choices very quickly. And they might make some good choices here and there, but if they're not able to really 
look through all the footage as much and they're not able to really take it in and take the time that that's necessary to work around it and creatively come up with these ideas to make it work then your your film will suffer for it so at the beginning you want to make sure that you are budgeting these things in and you are scheduling them so that you understand um, how long it's going to take and how much money it's going to cost. Does anyone have anything to add or any questions or any other rules of thumb that I left out, general in production or editing or post-production? Um, yeah. I, again, just, you know, the snap judgments and stuff, um, you definitely want to give like enough time and stuff, but like at the end of the day, when you get really good, people like that are really good at something can just suddenly like in a pinch they can if that makes any sense the high-end editors and stuff that cost who have been doing it for 20 years they'll just be like yeah usually it takes this long but if it's an emergency I can work extra hours or you know what I mean like there are ways around time solutions too if you're big enough and high high up enough yeah but as a general note you're right I just wanted to add that so editing is the most I, I had mentioned this the last meeting it's the most underrated uh department in the whole process and um editors are also seen as like miracle workers because even though they're underrated when it comes down to it they're looked upon and called upon to try to salvage and save the film at the end of the day which is not always the case and it becomes a problem and people underestimate or overestimate the, the editor when they do things like, because we, we didn't really go into it. We're talking about um, time and editing. You gave your general rules on how long it should take to edit. But you also mentioned that, you know, it could take up to six months to a year just to edit, which is pretty accurate. Um, yeah, these are just the average. I don't think they're, they're like a set set rule. But this is what we've heard from like people who do it professionally. Like this is the average. And those are good averages. It's just, you know, um, you know, if you're trying to get a, a good eyeball on, you know, how, how long it should take or how much it should cost or stuff like that. That's a that's a good rule to, rule to go by. Um yeah. but yeah, editors a lot you're a lot a thing that wasn't really mentioned is the thing called turnaround time. And this is when uh you know, you'll show a rough and the director or the producers or somebody will look at it and they'll say, well, I like it, but can you do this or take this out or add this? And then now say you spent all those hours you know, editing this, this footage and now they're asking you to do, they might even ask you to do something completely different. You kind of have to start over a little bit. Um, so there's that aspect of it that adds time and takes away. Like I had, um, the film I shot before I went to basic training in the military or boot camp, um, I shot it, and um, cause like I, I go home and I edit and I I sent them like roughs of like each scene that we edit, you know, just to show them, you know, um, not knowing that they were kind of like looking at the executives were looking at me like, oh, you know, we want now all of a sudden they're expecting me to edit too, which I didn't sign up for that. Um, so they had called me and they said, hey, can you do a, a trailer? Which was, the film wasn't even done yet. So I said, okay, well, I could, I could try to put something together. And I had put together a, a trailer and they looked at it and they're like, oh, there's, there's, there's too many guns in the, and there's too many guns and you can take all the guns out. And I was like, that's pretty much all we shot. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I can't take, I take away these guns. Like, you're taking away, like, a good 70% of the trailer. They didn't understand that. Just, not, just censor it with black bars. They didn't understand that at all. So like, like I said, editors are very underappreciated and under underrated and underappreciated. Or just for that principle alone, because like people that don't understand, yeah, I mean, every area can be like underappreciated or overappreciated, and how everything comes together is like ends up being brilliant and awesome. And again, like just get good, and then when you're good, people will want to put more money in. It's as simple as that. 
if that makes any sense, because that's just how it works. Here, here first, Brian, she said you're not good, no <laughs> Huh? Okay. Well, it's okay. And if you screw up, just <laughs> get back up and start again and just do it. I mean, it's frustrating the second time, but guaranteed, if you fucking biff something really badly, the second time is probably going to go. You're not going to biff it the same way. You just won't. Unless you don't change anything, if that makes any sense. So if you have a synapsis in your brain or a connection in your brain that always does this and you don't change it, well, then you will do it the exact same and it's not even within your control. But if you actually take the time to break it down and switch it up and change it, then the second time will be different. But if you do not do that and you do not, like if you're editing and you only know one or two ways and you always do that and they're like, we don't want it this way and you don't change it, well, the second time is not going to be any different. But if you actually go in and break it down and go, okay, they didn't like this for this reason, let's switch it up here. Then the second time it's going to be different, and it's yep. going to, or you, or you have to do it third time. No, here's what's going to happen. If you start doing that and you don't have the budget or the schedule put in for your editor, they're going to go, all right, here you go, go ahead and do your do your changes. No, yeah, for real. <laughs> the editor has a life and he has more jobs, and goodness gracious. Yeah. Well, but, the, but Brian's case. right. Like you, you yeah. have these these things that can come up, which is why these are general rules of thumb. They're not, that's why you shouldn't base it on it. And you should always buffer it to have extra schedule time, extra budget put in just in case, because you never know what's going to happen. And if and again, you do end up having something like that, where the editor edits something and it's completely off the mark of what you were going for, then you have to either change your editor or you have to edit it yourself. And that takes extra time and um, if you're hiring another editor or if you're just having that same editor do it, then they have to switch it all up and everything. That's going to take extra time either way. Yeah. And it's going to be extra money because you're going to have to pay them for the extra hours of changing everything and making it all different, which is going back to, okay, now instead of one script page equals one minute of, I mean, um, one minute edited equals one and a half hours of editing. Now it's we got to go back and do it again. So basically you made one minute edited equal three hours of editing. Yeah. And so now you've doubled that time. And um, so <laughs> that's definitely true and why these are just rules of thumb and they're not exact. And that's why you can't, and it depends on how, how difficult that scene is or how, how crappy the footage is. If it's crappy and it's really hard to work around, it might be harder for it to edit and it might take the editor longer to figure out how to make that scene work because they don't have the necessary ingredients, the necessary footage and emotional parts and the necessary moments that were shot well to get it to work. So they had to work around it and figure out these ways to get it to work. Or they might just have an overabundance of footage that is so hard to go through and takes forever. So it's going to up that time of how long it's going to take to edit that thing. That makes sense. And again, like if talking about budgets and stuff, like if it's a small scale and for practice, like just do it a bunch and get really good. But at the end of the day, you're either going to be working for somebody else, then do it exactly the way that they want. Um, or um, you'll get so high up where you'll be able to like play around and invest more. I guess if that makes any sense, I don't know how to else to ex explain that one. It's just like, and sometimes like we'll do like funding or like grants or like those are those other ways to like get something funded when you are, when it, you're talking about budgets and stuff. I wouldn't recommend doing everything out of pocket on a grand scale unless you're super rich. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I, I mean, like, that's why the oh, specific producers and stuff. That's what they do is they review and see what projects they want to do. So make sure that all your work is damn good so that and your ideas are damn good. So that if you know what I mean, you show up and everything is gold and take the extra time to like smooth everything else and hone it down. Show up um, completely capable or whatever. That's why I say pick a couple areas. I'd say, I always say like some people say pick one area and get really good at it and that works, but some people do better with two or three. So whatever way it works, I just think don't pick 10 or eight, you know? If yeah, that makes sense. definitely. Um, Cause like for me two, I can, one, I get hyper, like personally I'll get hyper-focused and I'll actually blow things because I'll put too much energy in. If I have two, then I can just go ding, step in the step out and it actually enhanced, I excel better at the one, if that makes sense. Yeah.
balance. I mean, every every single cute person has their own like method and madness. Um, I know that if I put in a hundred percent of my uh, time and energy, oftentimes it blows the fuse because I have a lot. <laughs> so that's why I do this uh, the side stepping, and then boom, it works and it all comes together smooth. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's Kimmy Hode. If you guys have any like suggestions or things like when working with like a director or a producer or somebody who's trying to get a certain thing out of you, but you it, it, it's not hitting right, no matter what you do, is this I don't even know how to explain that one. What do you do in those kinds of situations? Yeah, I don't know. So that's that's my thinking on that. Sometimes it's just like you you like you're working with somebody and all you're doing is like, okay, we want it this way, and you're trying to play it like do exactly what they want all the time. And like, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. It's like, okay, well, what what you know. That, that can be frustrating. It's nice yeah, like when right. like a director is like, okay, we want it this way, do it this way. And you're like, okay. Um, or like they hear your thoughts and go, actually that's better, we'll, we'll add this in, but we still want it this way, that works too. So whatever, um, close and works. Cause at the end of the day, when talking about big, big budgets and stuff, and if you have a producer and if you have people, you wanna make sure that the projects end up going as well and relatively as smoothly as possible so that um, it doesn't, you don't wanna be part of like something that ends up going really wrong. Or you Honey, um, is, is this like, how many topics after this, just so I know? No, that's the end. Oh, this is the last one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just wanted to know. The last topic? Yep. All right, cool. um, so. With that being said, that this was mainly like for, it's not just for editing, um, it's for, this was mainly on the budgeting side of things. We'll actually use these rules of thumb when we are doing the budgeting exercise. This is something that you might wanna like think about. And again, if you have any like fighting scenes or if you have anything that's very visual effects heavy or action heavy in your script, then you need to, extend these hours and these rules of thumb by a lot more than just one hour, one hour of production, $1,000 for one script page. If it's a fight scene, if it's stuff that needs fight choreography and other elements that are going to be more expensive, then obviously it's going to go up. And um, if, it's, if it's a fight scene, it's not going to take one minute of screen time if it says, you know, one, one little part of the page. It's not going to take, it's not going to be the equivalent and one script page isn't going to be the equivalent of one hour on set for different scenes that are more complex. So you want to be thinking about all that. But when we do our budgeting exercise, we're going to be going back and uh, re-repeating these a, a bit. And the, the, these, how many um, pages get shot per day is definitely something you also want to keep in mind. And the, you want to like think about, you also, when you're thinking about that, you want to also think about your crew experience level if you are working with a crew that isn't as experienced because you are you know you're trying to save on the budget then you need to factor in that it's going to take longer to set up each thing mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to get as many different shots done mm -hmm. uh, and again like bend before always make sure you bend before you you break and then also it's really great if you work with people that understand like right before you break, you're like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, I need five, five minutes. Um, give them the five minutes because it's better than dealing with a break. Yeah, uh, Sarah, when you said how long should you take to write the 100 pages, I agree with Brian. As long as it takes. For the script writing, you should take as long as it's needed unless you're working on a thing that um, is – from a studio and they've hired you as the writer if you have a and, deadline and you have a deadline then you have to figure out how to get it all done but if it's just but something hopefully... that you're making or, or you're making for yourself or you're just writing on your spare time take as much time as that needs do as many rewrites as that needs because that part is free unless you're hiring a writer that part is free and for that's you to write why it out. and i would say that is exactly and I would say that is exactly why it's important for um, you to work on your script before you, like, don't have, a, 
like work have a deadline for sh- for writing your script before you're like oh my gosh I want to shoot something I need to figure out a script no you you it's good for you to have scripts already written already prepared yes. or preparing on one working on one and then once you have it ready you you start pre-production and you start working on your thing because otherwise it's going to be rushed and it's going to be sloppy and if you have if you are working with a company that's why it's good for us to have um constantly be writing well people that write scripts constantly be writing more scripts constantly have material ready in case they need it um constantly be working on bettering your craft because that way if they ask you for material whether it's to see some of your own material to pitch it to them or a concept that they have you're practiced and you you worked on it to the point where you kind of have an idea of how to go about it you've practiced enough you've written enough and you can yes. create at least an outline yeah and i like i mean once you everybody like, every person's going to have their own way of doing it in their own amount of time yeah. that it takes them to do it and the more you do it, the more you'll start to realize how long it might take you to do it. But before you know, you, you don't really know. And that's why say, when I'm going back to like editing, again, I'm going to go back to editing one second. With the general rule of thumb, they're talking about editors that know what they're doing and know how to edit quickly because they've been editing projects. So the one hour to one and a half hours to edit to get one minute of finished edited project or film or whatever you're working on. Um, that is based on editors that, that know what they're doing and have edited projects already. When you have an inexperienced editor or a new editor or um, something like that, it's then you want to also factor in more time for it, which is why it's good when you're talking about budget, when you're talking about scheduling and budget, they always say that you should try to get your team pretty early on so that you can factor in these numbers, you can factor in these these um, schedules and this time and you can see how much your editor knows and like kind of what their experience level is. And as long as you know that they are less experienced, they're going to take longer. You can factor yeah. that in. Um, without if you, it being if you're the kind of person, if you're the kind of person that needs deadlines, you can always set deadlines for yourself um, at the level that you're learning and that you're working on. Like uh, most writers, when they have a, um, an agent, they will write a number of words a day, um, and then they'll just go rewrites and work on the pages and work on the story. So I would say, um, to Raphael's comment, just real quick, um, yes, if you have more experience, it will come easier to you, but that doesn't mean that, like, a specific story won't be hard. Um, I feel like if you're thinking of an idea, it yet you will have the experience and the formatting knowledge and all that to write it well but don't feel bad if a script needs more time because taking that like Coda said it's free and you're in the creative process you're not in the work mode yet like the work mode of of being on set on the busy busy set Um, you're in work mode but it's more free you have that time Um, give your story room to breathe let it um leave and come back to it every now and then it's okay to take time with your story because you do want it to be the best it can be and not be lazy not be sloppy not be rushed um because you wanted to get it out in a certain amount of time although yeah again but if you really do want to be like working on like a high capacity and stuff it's good to have deadlines and also like working in like a team or like with the studies and stuff having deadlines for each other is nice too i don't know yeah i just mean if you're working if you have the the if you have the ability to, and you're working on a specific project, if you have the ability to let it breathe a little bit, don't feel bad about it. That's all I know. You should set goals for yourself. If you're talking about script writing, you should set goals for yourself yeah. so that you are trying to meet those goals, but don't be constricted to those goals to where if you didn't get it done in time, then you are going to the story it. pretty much. You know, you just want to make sure that the story is center. The story is the most important thing, the characters, and, and you want to make sure you're getting it right because that's where it all starts. If you don't have a good script, then you know that film's probably not going to be very good. Yeah, so you, you could have made have it in like script. a week 
you could have written it in a week, but that doesn't mean it's going to be good, you know? Yeah, I've seen a, you know, YouTube video or or something, just the titles where they're saying, like, I wrote a film in two days. And it's like, well, that film's probably not that good. Like, that's probably not good at all, really. Honestly. Unless he had, like, this genius idea, but that's the... That, that's but that's yeah that's probably yeah. not because they didn't have time to review it and to look through it and to take time to go away from it come back to it same thing with editing i'm bringing it back to editing again and then i'm finishing it yes sir <laughs> uh with editing another thing i wanted to mention is if you are editing yourself mm -hmm. or if you have an editor also try to schedule in some time for them to be able to take maybe a small break away from it to be able to come back to it with a fresh mind Otherwise, it'll feel more like work and it'll feel a little more dull and less exciting and the uh, creativity and the ideas will start to slow down. So if you're and editing you can your just own become... project, if you're editing your own project or you don't have like a set deadline or whatever, um, or if you are hiring an editor, just make sure that you also factor in just a little not like a huge amount of time but just a little bit of time for them to be able to go outside and then come back to it or something you, know, you can you know, also 15, become desensitized minutes. by it because you see the same thing over and over again you end up missing things you end up not paying as much attention you end up brushing it a little bit because you've seen it so many times um and so that's also why they say like take a minute leave and come back because sometimes you're in the flow of things and you get some things, but you miss others because you've seen it so many times. My thing Yeah, and you want to come back to it with a fresh mind and to see it again, to see, because audience members are going to see it for the first time and they aren't going to have seen it over and over again. So if you come back to it with a fresher mind than you had before, where you aren't looking at the same thing over and over again and seeing every single little frame pass by, you will see it more as an audience member and where you'll see maybe there's some problems um, here where you need to add some if, if emotion I can just give or a, something like that. Yeah, if I can just give an example that crossed my mind um, real quick. Um, one thing that I think is a good example to think of is like you're editing um, a specific cut, you're, you're doing a specific cut, you're doing a specific edit to garner a specific emotion. When you're editing it, you know what emotion you're going for. So it's different than if you were to see it and try to understand, try to guess what emotion it's going for. So while you're editing, you might be like, you might lose track of that because you're like, okay, this is I'm going to give that, this is meant to give that emotion, meant to give that emotion. But if you maybe take some time and come back, you can look at it with fresh eyes. Okay, is it giving that emotion? It was meant to, but is it really? Does that make sense? I don't know if that was a good example or yeah, not. Yeah, that makes okay. sense somewhat. All right. So I'm going to end it, though, because we're going on too long and, like, rambling about different things. Um, I was, the last thing I wanted to say is that Monday, all we're going to do on Monday is we're going to watch a film based on its editing. So Monday sometime we'll be sending out an email and giving you guys a few different Yeah, y'all suck at picking, so we're going to, like, narrow it down. <laughs> We're going to give a few options and then you guys will decide and we'll do it like we did a bit last semester and the semester before that where yeah. we'll pick the one that has the most votes. I'll be um, looking this weekend into like availability and then I'll post the either top three or top four at the, at the most. And we're going to be watching for its editing, for its pacing, its flow, what kind of cuts and transitions it's using and how long it's staying on different shots. I mean, we were not going to exactly time it, but we're going to just pay attention to the edit and hopefully catch the You can if you want, want. to. <laughs> um, L cuts, J cuts, hard cuts, match cuts, quick cuts. What are they doing in this thing? How is it working? And when does it start to speed up? You might start noticing that it ramps up during a intense moment and then it starts to slow down. <clears throat> the duration of the shots might extend whenever it's a slower moment or a more emotional moment. How many, you know, do, are they leading us into the scenes with audio? Are they doing it with a visual cue? Are they matching it? What kind of match cut are they using? Those kinds of things we'll talk about while we're watching the movie and we'll pay attention to all these different editing aspects when we watch it. After we're, watch, after we're done watching it, um, this will also be due on February 28th. We will be making a um, clip or a short little scene moment that is in the same editing style 
as that as something we pick from the movie so if we pick a different a one scene that is very quickly cut to or something that starts out slow and then starts speeding up its cuts and we'll just try to match that style with a, a homemade scene that we do on our own um, and so it'll be a little difficult honestly to pull off but that's exercise is something that will get you more used to shooting for the edit because you'll be you'll be thinking about the editing while you are writing you'll be thinking about the editing while you're shooting it and you'll be thinking about the editing of course while you're editing so that is a, a good exercise to get a little more used to that aspect because even if you're not going to be an editor yourself you still want to try to think about like how this might be able to edit together like sarah was saying earlier in the meeting seeing it in your mind and kind of seeing how it plays out in your mind is good but you want to also make sure that the execution is good and that you're 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 getting the footage you need you have the ideas you need to make it work the way you're seeing it in your head and so knowing about all these different things and editing and trying to match it to that will really help the thing flow a lot better from beginning to end and the workflow will be a little more contained and that's always a good thing because you don't want it to be all over the place boundaries um expectations and rules and things that are set out clear before you begin are so handy they're brilliant and they're great um just as long as they're, they're said and they're clear because otherwise like i've been in situations where it's not clear and then you like piss off the wrong person so that's not a good time and then also being careful that you push yourself and others the right amount that you don't cause a break it's better to go hey you look like you need five and give them the extra literally five minutes or ten minutes it could save you hours or days yeah guys love you all but we're pretty sick and Coda's voice is breaking so i'm gonna stop the recording